What's going on, everyone? And welcome in to another edition of Be Shafe Daily. Brendan Schaefer here with you in the evening hours of Sunday, April 16th, 2023. And tonight we can start with the good. Sunday's walk-off win over the Pirates for the Cardinals, or we could start with the bad. Everything that happened on Saturday. Obviously, no podcast Saturday. Uh, if you didn't get my tweet or see my post on YouTube about that, uh, storms in the area kind of knocked out my internet for Saturday night, and so it was just going to be one of those deals, and I didn't have it in me to stay up till 4 a.m. waiting around to see whether or not it would come back. And so I said we're going to bang the podcast for that night. We'll do double duty on Sunday. We will talk tonight about Jordan Hicks. That's one thing I think from Saturday that I am going to get into. We got some more information maybe from the Cardinals about what holds, at least for the near future, for Jordan Hicks. And so we will talk about that. But we should start, I think, with the win from Sunday because it's more recent. Uh, you know, Saturday's loss, that's old news. Uh, we can get into some of the, those details as well. But we'll focus first on Sunday as the Cardinals were able to get that win in walk-off fashion, extra inning walk-off fashion, that is over the Pirates 5-4 to four in the 10th inning, bottom of the 10th. So we'll get into all of the things that took place there. Talk about Miles Michaelis' start, maybe the performance from the offense, how, boy, after a rough start to the season as a team when it comes to bases loaded, they haven't been able to get much done. Tommy Edmond eventually is the one to come through for the Cardinals. Can that be something that breaks them out of this slump? Uh, it was a bit of a slump for Edmond as well with, with uh, runners in scoring position and he was able to maybe kill two birds with one stone on the base hit that he got in the bottom of the 10th inning. So we'll get into that. Talk about the bullpen performance that the Cardinals got on Sunday as well. Uh, was a pretty good one to follow up the start by Michaelis. So all of that coming up on this edition of B-Shape Daily. Make sure you're subscribed on Spotify or Apple Podcasts to the audio version of B-Shape Daily. And check it out on YouTube, youtube.com slash at b 12 if you'd like to uh, view the video version of the show. But let's go ahead and jump right into things from Sunday afternoon at Bush Stadium as the Cardinals, as I mentioned, get the 5-4 to four win. And this was a game that started off very strangely with the base hit to center field by Cabrian Hayes to lead things off for the Pirates. Yeah, it was a base hit, a routine single that turns into a triple because uh, the revolving door in center field continues for the Cardinals as Lars Newtbar got the start in center on Sunday. And I already got some questions like, as the game was beginning, why can't the Cardinals stick with Dylan Carlson in center field? Why don't they see that he's their best defensive center fielder? A uh, couple of things with that. And if you stuck around and saw what happened in the game, Alec Burleson suffered a bit of an injury when he fouled one off his shin. Uh, he was showing the media his shin after the game, said everything's fine. Uh, not going to be a long-term concern by any means there for Burleson. But he did get removed from the game, started the game in left field, and then got taken out after finishing that at bat early on. And at first, Dylan Carlson comes into the game to play left field. And I'm thinking, here we go again. What is with the insistence to keep Dylan, their best defensive center fielder, out of center field? Uh, but it was weird. You hardly ever see this, I feel like. But it was a straight swap the inning after that where Newt Barr went into left field and they put Dylan Carlson in center field, which is, uh, I think, the alignment they should have had all along. It didn't come up after the game with Ollie Marmel as to why they, they waited an inning, maybe just to get a guy acclimated into the game. Uh, not entirely sure what the, the reasoning for that was because it didn't come up, but uh, I thought ultimately they landed with Dylan in center field the way that it should be. Once again, my belief is if Dylan Carlson is in the game, he should be in center field. But when it comes to Newt Barr beginning the game in center field, uh, I think the answer is pretty obvious. You've got, at least before this injury to Bertelson, and again, I don't think it's something that will impact him long term, but something to keep an eye on. Before that, though, you had Bertelson in left field hitting very regularly, and Jordan Walker in right field doing the same. The Cardinals want both of those guys to play because their at-bats, at least prior to today, had been dictating that they both should be in the lineup on a pretty regular basis. Uh, and, and in the case of Burleson, especially against right-handed pitching, uh, where he had that OPS, I, it was above 900. He goes 0 for 2 today. Um, had that ball fouled off his shin, and then I think the very next pitch he swung and, and, and had a fly out. Um, but even still, the OPS for Burleson after today's over 2 is at 814. So he's done a nice job. You've seen and we've talked about Ali Marmel putting him in near the top of the lineup in that number 2 spot pretty traditionally uh, when facing right-handed pitching. So Burleson, whether you think he's the best defensive outfielder, which he probably isn't, right, doesn't cover a ton of ground out there, although uh, did make the nice throw the other day uh, to, to nab a runner at home plate in the Cardinals' win on, I guess that was Friday night as of now. Uh, so 
you, you know, it's not really about his defense is my point. It's more about what he does offensively. And, you know, the same is said for Jordan Walker, who did pick up a base hit today, uh, but one for five, had a couple of strikeouts, struck out looking in the 10th inning there right before Tommy Edmond has his opportunity to win the game. And, of course, he did he did take advantage of that. Uh, but the OPS for Walker down to 702, not as robust as he had been going on a little bit of a slower stretch since the uh, 12-game hitting streak that he had to begin the season died down. So I don't know whether things will change. We had the conversation with Ollie a couple of days ago. Uh, I, I think this was, yeah, before Saturday's game, pretty much in depth about, and I guess this is information that people don't really know a ton about unless you were following on Twitter. I'm realizing now as I say it that we didn't have a podcast Saturday uh, to talk about it. But there was a, probably a 20-minute conversation in Ollie Marmel's office before the game, which a lot of times those those things can last around then. Um, but this was a, a longer conversation of a longer variety uh, that you get pregame. And a lot of the conversation was dominated by the notion of, hey, you've got five outfielders and only three spots for them on a daily basis. How does How's that working out? And Ollie talked a lot about the fact that they've got guys on this team who understand the situation, uh, recognize that, you know, they're not going to have the chance to play every day, but understand there's pressure when you do get in there to perform and to try and earn more time. And he said basically that's what Alec Burleson has done, and obviously Jordan Walker had done uh, so far in the first couple of weeks of the season with the way they've been performing offensively and so you circle it back to Lars Nupar is now off the injured list he's going to play I mean you're, you're not going to bring him off the injured list and not play him he was the guy that going back to you know December January Ali Marmel was saying publicly I believe it was a comment that was made back at the the winter meetings in December I want to say it was I wasn't there so I could be messing that one up uh, but it was way early in the offseason where Ali Marmel said the guy that you know we are considering locked into our outfield is, is Lars Nupar not Dylan Carlson, not Tyler O'Neill, not anybody else. Newpar was the one guy they said, hey, we feel pretty confident he's going to be in there every day and it might rotate around him or, or guys are going to try to earn opportunity around him. So if that's the case and you have Burleson in the lineup, you have Walker in the lineup, there's only one spot for Newpar to go and he is the best defensive center fielder of those three and so he's going to play center. Uh, didn't make a good read on the ball in the first play of the game for Hayes. Hayes ends up getting a triple out of it. And then a sacrifice fly scores the run. And so already, Miles Michaelis is sort of uh, behind the eight ball, which has been a pretty familiar spot for him so far this season, unfortunately, for Michaelis. Uh, but it was just kind of a day where those were the way the runs were scored against him. And I don't know if it's 100% accurate that it's just been the case that all season it's been that way. I'll play a clip from Miles here in just a minute uh, with his thoughts on sort of the way he's been a little bit snake bit and the way some of these runs have scored on not always the most firm of contact. But if you're watching that game today, Pirates get seven hits off of Michaelis in five and two-thirds innings. Uh, several of the batted balls were pretty hard contact. Um, but the way that first run scored, not a lot you can do about that. If you just allow the base hit and Newbar doesn't make the aggressive dive to try to take a hit away, you know, it ends up being a single and the rest of the inning probably unfolds pretty uh, standardly and that guy just might get stranded out on the bases. As it is, he goes to the third base immediately and so a fly ball to the outfield is going to score him from there, and that's uh, what the Pirates were able to do in that situation to begin the game. But I thought Michaelis did a nice job of sort of pitching around that early. Uh, it, it wasn't like it was a rally that he sort of had to grit through. It happened very quickly and then was able to start putting up some zeros uh, for the remainder of his outing until he got into uh, the later portion of the outing when in the sixth inning uh, the Pirates come up with another run against him and the Cardinals. And actually, I do have to make a quick correction. He gives up a run in the second inning, too. And the way that one unfolded uh, was one of the two walks that he gave to the eighth-place hitter, uh, to Cupida Marcano, I believe is how you say the guy's name. I, I, I'm going to butcher that. I apologize. Uh, but Marcano had two walks in the game, doesn't have a hit in the big leagues on the season, only four at-bats coming in. Um, so he's 0 for 4 on the season, but ends up getting two walks off of Michaelis on Sunday. And the first one led to an Austin Hedges base hit, which Hedges had like a 100 batting average, and he just kind of lofted one into left field. So again, that wasn't hard contact, but the walk is what cost Michaelis there in the second inning. Uh, and so then he was able to settle things down until the sixth. When the third run was scored against him, it was his run, but it was unearned ultimately because Marcano was coming up to bat again. And after two times facing him, Ali Marmel basically seemed to say, nope, we're not doing that again after uh, he had walked against Michaelis twice in a row. And Michaelis is... He was especially good-natured, I think, after this start because even though it wasn't his best one, he said he's almost uh, he's almost unhappy with the fact that he's so happy with. He said, I don't necessarily love the fact that I was actually happy with the way this start went. 
five and two thirds, gives up three total runs charged to him. Only two of them were earned runs. So not a quality start, but as close as you can get to it without being one. But he said he didn't love that he was happy about it because it isn't necessarily the kind of start that you really want to feel great about, uh, not able to get through six and, and allowing a few runs against you. But he said it's just nice to not get, you know, have a really bad one for the first time this season. The previous two for Michaelis had definitely been struggles. And so he felt like, even though maybe he necessarily didn't love the fact that he felt happy about the outcome of the game, he felt relatively happy about the outcome of the game. And obviously the fact that the Cardinals were able to win the game, I think that was uh, the most important part in that regard. But Michaelis had said of Marcano that he had a force field around the strike zone in the game today. And Miles said, I just couldn't throw him strikes for no particular reason. So when, when you give up two walks to a guy who doesn't have a hit yet on the big league campaign, probably a little frustrating, especially when that guy's the eighth place hitter, but uh, was just one of those things. And, and I mentioned he was good natured after the game. That was one of the lines to which I was referring where he just says, Hey, the guy had a force field around the strike zone. I don't know. It's just one of those things that happened, but I, I like that miles like Cardinals fans are probably frustrated because yeah, walking the eighth place hitter a couple times, not great. Uh, but you know, he's got, he's out there trying to execute and he says, there's a force field, man. I don't know what it was. I couldn't figure out a way to throw the guy's strikes. Uh, it makes me feel like maybe that's more of a one-off and not something that's going to consistently be a problem. Miles Michael is traditionally a pretty good guy within the strike zone, not going to walk too many over the course of his outings. And so that's one that you just got to chalk up to to maybe the randomness of the day. Uh, Marcano does end up hurting Miles Michael a third time uh, because they bring in Andre Pallante. He gets the exact ground ball to second base that he needs. All he said after the game that we can almost guarantee that he's going to, against a left-handed batter in that situation, give up a ground ball to the second baseman. Like they, the analytics are going to tell you that the percentage, very, very high chance with Polante trying to execute in that way uh, with runners on first and third gets the ground ball. Donovan, uh, very sure handed. He's a gold glover ends up kind of bobbling muffing the ball and then dives trying to pick it up. And it just, it just kind of ate him up a little bit, which allows that unearned run against Michaelis to score. So even after Michaelis was out of the game, it was like Marcano was still doing damage against him. It was kind of hard to figure uh, but just one of those games. But I asked Michaelis if, you know, given the the way some of the runs scored against you was kind of unusual, did that give him confidence that maybe, hey, this can be a building block sort of start for him? And you can hear that question and answer here. I'll play it now uh, on B-Shape Daily. Does the unusual way the runs came against you today sort of give you confidence to say, it, it, you know, it wasn't as though you are getting hit all around? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I've had a, f a few games where the way the runs are coming in are – not typical and they kind of coming in on on weak contact so you know kind of after my last outing i said there's not a whole lot i'm i'm trying to change here just almost looking for a, a change of fortune and so that was miles michaelis there talking about yeah kind of feeling like the soft contact is getting the better of them and in, in, in this game in this moment where they're scoring runs on a, a triple that was really a single and obviously the owner and run that came yes i think that's fair I don't know that that's applicable to what happened in Colorado necessarily, uh, but certainly anytime, you know, Miles Michael is more of a pitch to contact guy, although he has been getting quite a few more swing and misses this year than, than is typical. He talked about really that being a realization for him of even if it's, if, especially if it's a strikeout prone hitter that's at the plate, I don't need to feel like I have to overpower him so much as identify the spots in the zone that are problems for him uh, to be able to, to cover with his swing and beat him to that spot whether it's, you know, with the, the most overpowering fastball or the most uh, sharp breaking ball that he could possibly come up with. Yeah, you know, sometimes it doesn't need to be that if you know the, the, the hitter as well as you need to. And so that's been more of a focus for him in getting swing and miss this year. But overall, like, you're going to still probably consider Miles Michael as more of a pitch-to-contact guy. And I would say that a lot of the contact he has given up had been relatively firm contact. But today, sure, it's an example of a couple of those runs. And even all three of the runs end up coming on soft contact. But you can't discount the walk uh, to Mercano that allows the second run to score there in the second inning. So a little bit of a mixed bag for Michaelis. But overall, I I think progress in what you're seeing from his start, for sure, uh, given the fact that he was one out away from getting through six and very well could have done it. He was uh, 92 pitches, I think it was. They go to Palante there, which had some people on Twitter hot and bothered in my mentions talking about, needs to let Michaelis pitch through it and get an opportunity to, to go a little deeper. I really don't think, like, it is a priority for Cardinal starters to go deeper, and I understand that, but in a spot that's a close game there, 
and he'd walk this guy twice and you're you're at risk of maybe getting it away, uh, giving it away, I should say, in, in the ball game. Going to Palante, I don't think, is the wrong move, especially if you think you've got a matchup advantage, which against the left-handed hitter uh, for Andre Palante, the Cardinals did. Yes, it doesn't end up working out because of the error, but they got the exact situation that they wanted. And so, again, a lot of times we'll talk about the process and what the, the thought process is for the Cardinals in making certain decisions. And I think there the process was certainly sound. Uh, it's just the result doesn't necessarily come the way you want it to. And yeah, the bullpen gets a little more burdened because of that, but it's only by one extra out. I don't think he was going to pitch beyond the sixth inning. Uh, even if he finishes that frame, it was probably going to be Palante next. So yeah, if he's getting up near 100 pitches, I just I don't expect in a game where he hadn't been, I wouldn't say super sharp. He was he was solid. It was definitely an improvement over what he what he had done in his other outings. I just don't know if it's that big of a deal to say, yeah, we're going to go aggressively here in the middle innings to try to get something done. And Palante does his job. Zach Thompson came in thereafter. Uh, the Cardinals bullpen really did a nice job today. And that includes, by the way, Drew Verhagen, who came into the game in the 10th inning. Very difficult assignment in 2023 and, and any time post-2020, really, when you've got the Manfred man, as I certainly like to call it. It's a runner on second base to begin an inning. And for a pitcher, there's nothing you did to put him there, but he is your problem at that point. But Drew Verhagen got three ground ball outs. Unfortunately, a ground ball that advances a guy to third. The second ground ball was up the line, first baseline for Paul Goldschmidt. I think he had half a mind to try and make a play on it, and that's why he kind of bobbled the ball. I think he was considering getting to it quickly and trying to throw home to cut down the runner and keep it a tie game. Uh, it's probably for the best that he did bobble it, though, because I think it would have been a very difficult play for even a gold glover like Goldschmidt to make because his momentum was carrying him into foul territory, essentially. He was going to have to stop on a dime and without a lot of momentum behind his throw, make a pretty long throw home from deep behind the first base bag. Uh, had he fielded it cleanly, that might have been his intention. You could just tell the body language seemed like he was uh, hustling to try and make that sort of play. Once he bobbled it, though, wisely just takes the out at first base. And then Verhagen gets out of the inning with another ground out. So nice job by Verhagen. Gallegos looked good with a scoreless inning, had a strikeout, no runs, no hits allowed. Zach Thompson, inning in a third of the exact same, uh, was able to be efficient. And that's why, you know, even though the, the starter doesn't get through six, the Cardinals really had no trouble in this game uh, navigating the rest of that sixth inning and then seven, eight, nine, ten in order to keep it close. Now, you go 10 innings in the first place because the offense, once again, it was a struggle with men in scoring position uh, and at times a struggle to get men in scoring position for the Cardinals, but they have a bunch of guys left on base in this game. And again, I'll never know the actual number of physical guys left on base. And if you know how to access it easily, tell me where to look because all I ever look at is the box score on MLB and it says 20 left on base. I absolutely know that's not the case in a game where the Cardinals had, well, maybe 12 hits. Maybe they did leave 20 on base. Um, but if you have 12 hits and, five walks, that's still not going to get you to 20. Um, so I don't think that's necessarily right. Like Jordan Walker had six left on base. It's because he struck out in the 10th inning with the bases loaded. Uh, that, you know, had Tommy Edmond done the same, it was going to be three more left on base to his tally. But instead, he ends up with the base hit that wins the game. Nevertheless, that's my rant about left on base. Cardinals left a lot of guys on base because in the early portion of this game, they were not coming through in the clutch. Tommy Edmond coming into the game, I believe this is the number, and if it's not, just ignore me because it'll be very close to what the actual number was. 0 for 13 on the season with runners in scoring position and then went to 0 for 14 in a bat that he had earlier before that 10th inning where he did come through for the first time with Risp on the season. And the Cardinals, leading into that Edmund at bat, were 1 for 16 on the season with the bases loaded. Jordan Walker had two opportunities uh, in the game and, and did not come through in either of them with the bases loaded. And so it was just a monkey that the Cardinals really needed to get off their backs. And it was Tommy Edmond that was able to come through and get it done. He only has the opportunity because, and we were talking about this in the press box, the fact that Nolan Gorman is just like the unsung hero of the last couple of days, obviously uh, had the, the big hit in the 10th inning today that would have won them the game. I mean, it would have been him that we would be wondering if Miles Michaelis was going to give him the ice bucket bath. I'll play a clip from Michaelis explaining what that was about. Uh, here in just a minute after we kind of wrap up our conversation about this 10th inning. But Nolan Gorman, man, has just continued to do really well and sort of under the radar from an offensive perspective. Goes two for five uh, in this game today. Had that double that, again, it would have been the game-winning hit, but it's a ground rule double that goes over the wall. Sets up the intentional walk of Nuke Bar, which happened twice in a row. The prior at bat, they did it then to try to get to Jordan Walker. 
And he was so close to the Michael Jordan meme of, and I took that personally because Walker hit one deep to the outfield center field, uh, probably one of the deepest spots in the ballpark and missed a home run by five or six feet or so. Uh, Walker did give it a ride, but not quite enough. And then the second time he comes up with the bases loaded, strikes out looking, uh, maybe not the situation you want, but not worried about Jordan Walker. I think he's uh, going to be just fine. But Gorman in the series ends up with, over the last three games, had a three-hit game on Friday, a base hit, and an RBI on Saturday. And then Sunday comes up with a two-hit game, would have been the game-winning hit, but he doesn't get the uh, the accolades because the ball, well, it jumped over the fence. So uh, just something to keep in mind. I know we are, are trying to cover when players are hot, kind of keep everybody abreast of certain situations. And when it comes to Nolan Gorman, he's still doing it. OPS of 1088 on the season. Uh, just because we're not saying his name a ton, it feels like, relative to the contributions, uh, doesn't mean those contributions are not happening. Uh, speaking elsewhere in the lineup, Newt Barr coming up with the big home run. That was the big swing that the Cardinals had uh, in the sixth inning, bottom of the sixth there. After the error by Donovan, the Cardinals are looking for something to get it going. And I think if they don't make something happen there relatively quickly, it would have been hard to see the Cardinals mount the comeback that they uh, would have ultimately needed in this game. But it was Lars Newpar. He was able to do it with uh, his first home run of the season. Really had not been swinging the bat much at all since coming off of the injured list to where uh, you kind of wondered, you know, when are we going to see him really uncork on one? Well, the reason is it's not really his fault. He had a couple of walks Saturday and then three walks in the game on Sunday. Uh, it, it, two of them were intentional, but does get the home run. And when he struck out, it was a strikeout looking, I believe. So it might have been his only swing of the day. I'd have to go back and check, but... One for two with three walks. You'll take that as a very interesting stat line for Newpar. Obviously, with the base hit, it ends up looking a little bit more normal because I guess that brings him to a 287 average because he's two for seven. But the on-base percentage is 667. He's getting on base quite a bit. Uh, The average before was like one for six, one for five, whatever. So the discrepancy was even even greater there. But Lars Newpar, I think he's going to be fine, guys. I think he's going to end up being really good. Um, I'm, I'm interested to see though, what happens when it comes to where everybody plays in the outfield. If Burleson needs a day or two, uh, do the shin thing, which he may need not any days, but they may give him one just to make sure he's totally back and ready to go. Uh, does Newt Bar play more center field? Does Dylan Carlson earn these opportunities? We haven't seen Tyler O'Neill in the starting lineup in a couple of days, and he ends up scoring the winning run today because he pinch runs at third base, uh, in, in that situation with the Edmund base hit. So, uh, makes sense to use him in that way to get your fastest guy on the team, arguably uh, available 90 feet away to score that run. Um, nice for him to cross the plate, but I'm sure he'd like to take some at-bats as well. And it's just, it illustrates the squeeze that's going to be on playing time when all these outfielders are healthy. Uh, and and performance, I think, is going to matter. It's just going to be interesting to see, like, how long of a leash do some of these guys have if they're if they're playing well? Like, Burleson had certainly cemented himself in the, the mind of Ollie Marmel, at least. That like, yeah, he's one of our regulars against right-handed pitching. He's going to be in there. Uh, but does a slump of one day, two day, three day, four day, five days, what does it take to be, if you're another outfielder in this mix, to be one of those other guys that, that takes the opportunity and uh, runs with it and then gets more chances in the lineup daily because of that? It might be a hard nut to crack. We'll be interested to see kind of how Ali Marmel has to juggle it. And, you know, he made the case that, like, it's not – fair to any of these guys to Carlson or to Tyler O'Neill that they're going to be sitting the bench um, maybe more than they're in for the Cardinals over the coming weeks just because of the way it is but like there's not anything that can be done about it it's just it doesn't have to be fair it's not the business of fair Um, and and those guys I guess the onus is going to be on them to try and produce in the limited opportunity that they get Uh, I know that it there's a, a glaring neon sign above all these players right now of hey one of these guys can be a trade chip that's awesome totally get it understand why fans would talk about it I can't tell you how many times I've seen oh the Cardinals should trade insert outfielder here for starting pitching great don't you think if it were that easy they would have already done it that's sort of my thought process on the whole thing like they they knew they had all these outfielders in spring I think that yes it's something that I I would have made sense to have done uh certainly over the winter we talked a lot about it on B-Shape Daily right like if you've been listening back into the into the, the winter months we had a lot of conversations about the types of trades that would make sense for the Cardinals to do. But think back to those conversations. Who are the specific names that I was saying, eh, could see these guys floated out as trade chips? Guys like Nolan Gorman, who's been their best hitter basically this season. Guys like Alec Burleson, 
who is really looking like a big league bona fide hitter at the plate uh, as a, a key part of the Cardinals order when he's in there. So it might be one of those things where if the Cardinals had made uh, one of those deals that we talk about, maybe we look back on it like the Rosarena deal and go, oh man, that's that's the one that got away. So credit to Mosellock for, I, I think in the offseason, knowing that a trade was almost a necessity with the way the roster was set up, but not doing a deal that could have been bad for the Cardinals. Not doing one that says, well, this is convenient in the moment because of the way our roster math works, uh, but we really like Nolan Gorman, so what do we do? Ah, let's just make the deal because we really want this not to be complicated. It was more complicated to keep some of these guys and to not make a move, um, but the Cardinals didn't feel like they were probably getting the offers and the uh, you know, the types of, of fair, equitable deals for both sides that would make sense that you need when you're trading major league players for major league players. And ultimately they held serve. And I think it's to their benefit because like, I don't think Dylan Carlson was getting a lot of attention in the off season in terms of trades from other teams. I don't think that Tyler O'Neill was either. Uh, Tyler O'Neill. I, I just, I just doubt it based on the season that he had the injury history and the fact that it was a market that seemed to be dominated by other teams interest in left-handed power and O'Neill is right-handed power. So I just don't know that, Again, this is not inside information. I'm just kind of speculating based on what we all have known and heard about over the past few months. I don't feel like O'Neill was a guy that necessarily was drawing a ton of interest in that the Cardinals were super close to making a move that involved Tyler O'Neill. Uh, Carlson, similar thing with the, the struggles that he had last year. He was pretty much exposed, or, or maybe not exposed, but the Cardinals were using him like he was a, a strictly a platoon guy, right? And we're still seeing a, a lot of the effects of that, whereas a switch hitter, they don't really seem to trust him against right-handed pitching. Tommy Edmond is getting the run at shortstop, but it has had sort of a similar split, which is, I think, what was so important about the hit that he had today to be able to do it from the left side against right-handed pitching. He's been absolutely thumping lefties, as he did all of last year, Tommy Edmond. Um, but righties, it's been more of a struggle. He's been putting in a lot of work to try and, and you know, make that happen. He said today uh, of that extra work, it's just been about – putting his body in a more athletic position, a freer swing uh, from the left side of the plate to be able to do damage and uh, definitely a damaging swing that he had in the game on Sunday to be able to come up with the game-winning hit. But it's just one of those things that you look at these different players and go, all right, what's their level of opportunity? Edmund, I think, is pretty entrenched defensively as their, as their everyday shortstop. Uh, Mason Wynn could maybe have something to say about that down the line, but for now, it, it's definitely uh, Edmund's going to be an everyday player, and so he's got to figure out how to hit right-handed pitching. But the Cardinals have other luxuries when it comes to the outfield, that they don't have to do it that way with guys like Dylan Carlson. And they've uh, really, at this point, looked for reasons not to extend uh, Carlson that extra opportunity. It's not that they're doing it on purpose. I think it's, again, it's just a product of all of the guys they have, the five outfielders in that mix. And Carlson's got pretty good skills maybe in every category, but in each category, it seems like, well, if you're going to be against right-handed pitching, Burleson, his you know, contact skill, his at-bat skill against RHP is going to trump what Carlson does. So Burleson's in left over Carlson. Center field, well, we think the power of Tyler O'Neill is, is something tantalizing that we want to chase. And we think his speed and elite, you know, athleticism is something that could lead to him being a better defensive center fielder. So Dylan was getting boxed out there at times. Now Lars Newport's coming back in, though, and he's the one that has been sort of bestowed the opportunity. So that's what's going to be really interesting to me about just how the Cardinals divvy it up again, if everybody remains healthy. Um, and, and Jordan Walker's going to play, I think, pretty regularly, although uh, on Saturday, Ollie said, you know, does Jordan Walker need to play 12 games in a row? Probably not. That was more a product, I think, of they were going to let him ride out that hit streak until it ended, and then he was certainly getting a day off the very next day, which is, of course, what happened. But it's interesting, right? It's very intriguing to see where things are with the Cardinals outfield situation. Um, a lot of good players. I, I think I think you got five good players there. Uh, are there any great players in the bunch, any well-rounded, full superstars at this point? Uh, a lot of people would say Jordan Walker is the is on the cusp of getting to that point, but let's not put too much on the kid's plate. Again, the OPS right now is 702. That's not great. So it's it's there are going to be ebbs and flows, I think, on the path to stardom for Walker. I certainly think by the end of, you know, I'm not going to give it a timeline, but by the end of the day, he's going to get there. Uh, Lars Nupar, certainly a guy with, the, his ability to just get on base and then do damage in the strike zone when he does swing. He, and defensively, he is athletic. I think he's better in the corner outfield, but 
uh, can handle himself in center. And the, almost the exact same play that he kind of messed up in the first inning happened later in the game. And he just allowed it to be a regular single uh, so as not to, you know, replicate that and try to dive and make the sensational play. I did think maybe in, if you're watching the Cardinals broadcast, you probably hear Jim Edmonds talking about this today. Um, but just maybe there is a little bit of playing a little too deep, I feel like, for outfielders. Um, but you don't want to get burned deep over your head and, and have it turn into extra bases that way. So I understand it. Uh, it's just a matter of you got to get comfortable out there. And in Lars Newpar only a couple of games in center field, a uh, couple of games at all because he hurts himself on opening day and, and then was not able to play for uh, 10 days or 12 days or whatever it was. So I think ultimately the outfield, interesting situation. Uh, I think it's it's just a matter of they don't have Dylan Carlson in the daily lineup right now. And so that's why you're seeing Lars Newpar in center field. Um, but it could be a case where if Burleson needs a couple of few days, they will switch that up, and they did switch Carlson and Newpar mid-game. So I think I think we have gotten to the point where O'Neill and Carlson are in the same game, O'Neill and Newpar are in the same game, I, or pardon me, Carlson and Newpar are in the same game. I think you are going to see Dylan Carlson playing center field more than you at least had the first couple of weeks. They tried it. They know Carlson's the best one now. I think they're starting to come around on that in that experiment from the first couple of weeks. I'm predicting may end up more of a thing of the past. But I want to go ahead and do this before we wrap up the conversation sort of about the offense. I know we shifted into a conversation about the outfield more. I had been talking about Tommy Edmond. You know me. I get I get lost and say, hey, here's something you need to know, and it leads to another and another. But I did want to play this from Miles Michaelis because it was funny. His discussion about after the game, Jeff Jones had asked Miles if he had seen who shredded the jersey of Tommy Edmond because it was kind of hard to tell from up in the press box. But, you know, the shredder, the old Nick Punto move, uh, Tommy was was having that jersey busted open, and so he had, Jeff Jones had asked Miles the question. I think it was Wilson Contreras, by the way, which is fun. There's a great image, uh, AP photo, that I used on my story for KMOV.com about the game. You can check that out, KMOV.com slash sports. In the photo, you've got Contreras giving a big hug from behind to Edmund and uh, Miles Michaelis walking away with the little Gatorade-branded ice bucket that he uh, had brought onto the field. And so interesting the way this went down and we'll let you guys decide what you think actually happened here with miles michaelis but hear what michaelis had to say about the situation as it involves the ice bucket after the walk-off hit oh no i didn't see i I was out there with the ice bucket and then like right as i was about to throw it i felt kind of bad because it was so cold so i kind of (laughs) just yanked it to the side and threw most of the ice in the grass one of the unintentional intentional passes on the ice. yeah i was like ah you know it's kind of cold um if it was Walker, we were for sure going to get him. Oh, yeah. He was going to get subbed. Then- so what do we think about that? Miles Michaelis, at least allegedly, deferring to uh, the veteran status of Tommy Edmond a little bit by saying, well, and, and Miles later said, I, I wasn't going to put this audio out there because I think it I think it was a bit of a, not the way he wanted to phrase it, but he said, you know, Tommy, older guy. I think he meant like, you know, more veteran guy. Miles is obviously older than Tommy. Tommy's like my age, so older guy but older than Jordan Walker because all of them are, right? So I thought that was kind of funny where he says, yeah, I thought about it. It was like 40-something degrees out there. It was miserable. Uh, But I love this answer, too, for Miles Michaelis, though, when it came to the weather. I think John Denton asked him, you know, you're a Florida guy. He's from Jupiter. Uh, You know, it kind of the obvious question is, a guy from Florida, how'd you like pitching out there in the – in the cold. And I wonder if it's something that is just a canned answer that Michaelis gets. Uh, he, he knows he's going to give it anytime he gets this question. Uh, no, you know, he was like enthusiastic about how great the weather was. He said, Oh, it was a really nice day out there. Love, love pitching uh, in that weather. It doesn't bother me at all. So I wonder if that's just like something that he's heard enough times. That he just knows that that's the way he's going to answer that question. Um, but to his credit, Pitch fine out there, had his has best start of the season, which is not necessarily a super high bar um, by by his own admission, but it was one where he was able to keep the Cardinals in it long enough for them to win the game. And uh, again, the clutch hitting that they got at the end, it, it felt like inevitable to me throughout this game, even when things were going a little bit funky in the late innings, that the Cardinals would win it. But it definitely shouldn't have taken 10 innings, should have had a couple of other times where they would have gotten it done sooner than they did. Uh, but all's well that ends well, and Ollie Marmel said it makes for a you know much better Sunday to win this game in a walk-off fashion instead of losing it. So hopefully it's something that they can roll with and continue to push on and in, into the uh, the coming games, which it's uh, another series that starts up on Monday night against the Arizona Diamondbacks. Have been playing some pretty good baseball early in the year. Uh, I believe they knocked off Sandy Alcantara today in the. Uh, it was a matchup between Zach Gallen and Alcantara, 
Gallon, of course, now pitching for the uh, the D-backs. And that was the two guys that were in the uh, – two of the guys, I should say, that were in the Marcelo Zuna deal with St. Louis. Um, so, yeah, Gallon went to the Marlins, and then the Marlins turned around and dealt him to the Diamondbacks. They got Jazz Chisholm, though, for that – in that deal, and he's on the cover of MLB The Show now. So I guess that deal worked out okay for the Marlins. But, uh, yeah, he was – I think he was no-hitting them. Uh, Gallon was there for a little bit. And so he outduels Alcantara in that game. Uh, Cardinals fans, you don't want to talk about that. We – like the number of hours we spent talking specifically Sandy Alcantara, Zach Gallon in the Ozuna trade over the years is uh, a lot of hours. You could probably go back and, and log it. And I, I think it would definitely be in the, in the plural hours mark over the course of the history of B-Shape Daily. But enough of that today because we got to talk about Jordan Hicks and the things that happened in Saturday's Cardinals game. So Saturday was also an extra inning game against the Pirates in which the Cardinals did not take full advantage of of their opportunities earlier on in the game. We've heard that story because we just talked about it when it came to Sunday. They were pretty two similar games. Uh, the difference being in this one that Jordan Hicks comes into the 10th inning and did not do what Drew Verhagen did, which was limit the damage. No, no, he very much did not. It was a two-run home run right out of the gate for Jordan Hicks on Saturday. So I guess you could say he didn't walk the first batter that he faced, which is positive, but... Ali Marmo bringing in Jordan Hicks into a situation that was, I mean, we've talked about inherited runners and Jordan Hicks. The fact that those two things really have not historically mixed for the Cardinals this season and really even going back to last year, that had been the case. So an interesting decision, to say the least, that I know a lot of Cardinals fans were fired up about. People did not like it that Jordan Hicks was the choice there for the 10th inning um, for the Cardinals. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's understandable. uh Andrew McCutcheon takes you deep. That's a 5-3 game. Uh, then it was a triple allowed by Connor Joe, or I should say scored by Connor Joe. And he ends up getting driven in on a base hit. That was Jackie Robinson day Saturday. So the line score on Jordan Hicks, not too friendly. If you've been watching Cardinals games the last few weeks. You are used to that because it's been a struggle for Hicks, who uh, allowed two earned runs. <clears throat> Pardon me. Two earned runs and three total runs in uh, Saturday's game. Obviously, the one that was unearned was the Manfred Man, which uh, is a bummer that it, that it was the case. But if you're the Cardinals, you got to go to somebody in that spot in the 10th. In the and that's what ultimately Ollie Marmel had to say about it, which is that if you look at everybody that pitched on Friday and you looked at the guys that had already pitched on Saturday behind Stephen Matz, Chris Stratton, and Ryan Helsley got them to the 10th. And the day before that, Verhagen, uh, everybody in the bullpen essentially had pitched already in that game on Saturday or had pitched Friday and was unavailable, except for Jordan Hicks and Hennessy Cabrera. In that spot in the lineup, they felt it was not a spot that was going to be conducive to success for a left-handed pitcher like Hennessy Cabrera. So whether they wanted to or not, it ultimately amounted to the fact that it had to be Jordan Hicks in that situation for the Cardinals. And they understand that the inherited runners thing is a problem, has been a problem for him. But at the end of the day, they didn't want to put a lefty into that spot against McCutcheon, which makes sense. And then even, I think, more right-handed batters were behind him in the lineup. And so they had to go with who was available. Uh, the one guy that had not pitched, I, I need to correct myself a little bit there. Polante had not pitched, but had said before the game to Ollie Marble that he needed another day due to arm fatigue. And so he just needed one more day. He was not available. They were really trying to stay away from him. And so they go to Jordan Hicks and it blows up in their face. He gets one out, but allows three runs to earned, as I mentioned, and uh, the big home run to, uh, to McCutcheon, which busted open the game there. And the Cardinals did not strike in the bottom of the 10th. They lose it six to three. And there was a lot of consternation about the Hicks situation, which I totally do understand. Like, his ERA for the year is 12.71. He's been bad pretty much every time he's come into a game, and something's got to give. I thought leaving the press box that night that maybe Jordan Hicks would not be on the, the active roster the next day. He was. Uh, I was not at the pregame session this morning, but I can kind of tell you what happened based on uh, what had been reported. And John Denton, if you want to read about it, wrote a good piece uh, with the news updates at MLB.com. Uh, and it's titled Cards Hicks to Work Through Struggles at MLB Level. And basically, the clubhouse opening this morning, 
and I saw this from Jeff Jones's tweet, was delayed from the time that it was going to be, from the posted time, for the media to go into the clubhouse. And then you talk to Ali Marmel, and that's kind of the, the usual order of the morning. They delayed it. And it sounds like the reason for that, according to the, the story from John, following a lengthy pregame meeting between Jordan Hicks and Cardinals management on Sunday, Marmel says the struggling reliever will be used primarily in low leverage situations in hopes of helping him regain his past form. That's from John Denton's story. All right, so I guess they were talking it over with Hicks, and that maybe bled over to where you don't want a bunch of media coming in the clubhouse at that time. Makes sense. And so they had that conversation, probably not a comfortable conversation, but there's an interesting angle to this that I, you know, I, I don't know what the extent of it was because I wasn't there to ask about it this morning, unfortunately. But a lot of people say, well, send him to AAA and have him work out his issues there rather than basically be a waste of a spot in the bullpen where you know that that's a minus one every day for guys that you, you need to be able to count on in leverage spots. They're just basically saying right now, we're not going to give those spots to Jordan Hicks. And that does put the bullpen in a bit of a bind. So why not maybe a stint in Memphis to try and work those things out? It's a fair question. And I don't know that this is the answer because once again, I don't want to act like I was in a meeting or in a uh, media session that I was not there for, but the answer could be related to, or at least the context is relevant that Jordan Hicks cannot be sent to Memphis without his consent. He's got five years of service time, and so he would have to agree to that assignment. It's not like the team can just send him there in, in, w without him agreeing that it's uh, something he wants to be on board with. They can't do it. Now, they could DFA him if they, if they were that far gone with Jordan Hicks, but the raw talent is tantalizing, right? The triple digits, the nasty slider when it's working really well, and on Saturday he threw like seven consecutive sliders which was kind of a question that would have been interesting to hear from Wilson Contreras what the reason for that was. I still don't know um, because I I left the clubhouse before Contreras came in. If he ever did show I, while the media was eligible to be in there, I don't know. Uh, Jordan Hicks did not. We waited around for him for a while, and then we were told by Cardinals PR that they believe he had gone home. So didn't hear from Jordan Hicks. And according to John's story uh, at MLB.com, Hicks was not around pregame either to be uh, uh, available for media just, you know, we basically go in the clubhouse and see who we see. It's not like a, a formal, he made himself unavailable. He is, nobody saw him, and so he didn't talk to anybody. Makes sense. But, yeah, Hicks, you know, was out of there before anybody could talk to him Saturday. Not sure, again, on Contreras, if that was intentional, if they called seven straight sliders, if Hicks was shaking him off, kind of what happened there. Kind of harder to tell with Pitchcom nowadays. You can't just look at, you know, what fingers they put down and, and say, oh, okay, that's that's what it is. You don't really know. So, um, but it's... It, Clearly, it's a situation where the fastball or the sinker, which is what it really is usually for Jordan Hicks, he does throw a four-seamer, I believe, but the, the sinker is the main one when you hear about the 105. That's what it is. Um, the confidence level in that pitch clearly is is not where it, it has been in the past, and so going to the slider that often ends up hanging one to McCutcheon, obviously, I think 86.9 miles per hour. So, yeah, hittable pitch. You leave that over the plate, that, that bad things are going to happen. And so bad things did happen to Jordan Hicks there, but – has that meeting with the Cardinals and with Ollie Marmel and, you know, the resolution to that is he's he's going to remain on the active roster, uh, but going to use them in low leverage spots, which Cardinals fans are going, duh, like that's what we've been asking for all this time. But understand that there were the limitations placed on the bullpen uh, with the guys that were unavailable Saturday. And I'm sorry, but like it was the right call to use Jordan Hicks over a Henesis Cabrera when you're just not going to feed your your guy who's, I'm not going to call him a loogie because they don't really do the lefty-only guy, but it's like he's there to face lefties primarily. That's what Henesis Cabrera's role typically is uh, from the left side. And so Hicks is the guy, like, if he's on your roster, he has to be able to pitch in that spot. When nobody else is available, Jordan Hicks has to pitch in that spot. And if you're only Marmel, man, it's like, I, how how hamstring can I, can I be made into and still be expected to thrive when my starting pitchers aren't getting through six innings, and so we're using more of our relievers each day than we wish we'd had to. Uh, that leads to those guys getting fatigued, right? They came back from Colorado, and so that definitely plays a part. Miles Michael is talking about uh, can't really use certain pitches like the curveball, have as much confidence in the curveball out there because of the altitude, and then you come back off of that, and guys, you know, <clears throat> they're going to feel a certain way. Their bodies are going to respond to it, and uh, they want to try to battle through that for sure, but in some cases, you don't want to risk an injury, and so Andre Pallante made the decision uh, yesterday to tell him pregame, like, yeah, I think I need one more day and I'll be good to go. And then, sure enough, he was good to go and, and pitched fine and, and did his job for the Cardinals on Sunday. So 
it's just kind of a tricky spot to put Ollie Marmel into, and fans instantly jump to Ollie's terrible, all of this stuff. And it's like the context, I think, is pretty important there, guys. Like if every literally everybody was unavailable to pitch because they had pitched the day before and threw too much to where they weren't going to back-to-back them this early in the season, or they maybe recently had a back-to-back and you know they, they're trying to give guys bonus days in that situation. Uh, and now you've got a guy in Jordan Hicks who they say, yes, he's going to stay on the roster, but can't use him in certain spots. Man, that's tricky to me. And so I, the, the thing I'm circling back on is, okay, they cannot send him to AAA without him agreeing to it. Seems to me he didn't agree to it, right? Like, I would have imagined that that would have been something that was proposed in that meeting. Like, hey, Jordan, what do you think about this? We want to send you to work on X, Y, and Z. And he said no. Like, I don't know that that's what happened, but wouldn't it stand to reason? If you're the Cardinals, if you're Ollie Marmel, you're going, what use is a guy to me that that can't pitch in the leverage spots when I have half my guys on a given day that aren't going to be available because they're pitching so much to try and cover for the starters? It's a tricky spot for a manager to be in. So I don't know. If you're listening to this, hopefully you're not among the fans that are just like, oh my gosh, Ollie is the worst for bringing in Jordan Hicks. Like, if Jordan Hicks is on this team, he should be used in those situations, especially when you have the circumstances of the rest of the bullpen unavailable in those spots. So I'm totally on Ollie's, you know, Ollie's behalf saying that was not an Ollie Marble problem. It was eventually shouldn't Jordan Hicks be expected to get out problem. I know the inherited runners has been a problem and it's not a new problem. And so by this point, the Cardinals should recognize to try to give him clean innings. And that'll be for the better of the pitcher and for the better of the team. Totally understand that. But there are limitations when you've got, uh, it, it doesn't all happen in a vacuum. That's the best way to put it. It doesn't all happen in a vacuum. And so, they needed Hicks to be able to come into that spot and do what he could do. What he could do was, again, not be able to retire the first batter of, of an outing, which he's had, you know, six or seven outings, whatever it's been this year. I'm not sure he's done it once. I think maybe one time he did retire the first batter. But other than that, it's been a lot of walks, and now you can add the home run to the uh, to the ledger. So it's a difficult spot for the Cardinals to be in, but what they're going to do right now is keep him at the big league level. And it may be because he said, I don't want to go to the minors. And again, they cannot send him there unless he agrees to it. And so if the player says, I don't want to do it, you've got two options as a team. You can keep them on your active roster and try and work through this, which is what they're doing, or you can DFA and then trade him. And I I think they would probably be able to get somebody to bite on a trade, but the obvious desperation of the Cardinals to be in that spot would be such that I don't think you would have, uh, I don't think you would have like a, a big get coming in for a Jordan Hicks trade. Not right now with, with where things are at. So, Best case scenario for the Cardinals is that he does figure it out in the low leverage that they're going to put him into, and then he works his way back into being a reliable, trusted reliever in some of the tougher, high leverage spots. But like I said, I don't know if he refused, if they asked him and he refused in terms of the assignment. I wasn't there for that conversation, so I cannot pretend to be. Um, But I, I do think it's interesting that it would have seemed like an obvious spot to maybe offer that up and say, hey, could it be something that you'd be open to? Um... Don't know if that was asked. Don't know ultimately if uh, if it ended up that he had a chance to respond to that either way. But the moral of the story is Jordan Hicks is going to remain on the roster uh, and the Cardinals could really use him. They could really use a guy of his talent level to be able to uh, pitch to his capabilities and, and return as one of those prominent right-handed relievers in the bullpen. Uh, for now, I'd say you're going to see a lot more of guys like Drew Verhagen in those spots like you did today. In the 10th inning, he came in and totally did his job. Like, the fact that the run scored, nothing you can do about that. It was an inherited runner. He had three ground outs, weak contact, all on the ground. Very much what you're looking for out of Drew Verhagen. So, positivity in that regard for the Cardinals. Uh, The Hicks stuff, though, that's really the main thing I was going to get into from Saturday. Try to not dwell on the the minutia of a game that the Cardinals lost there uh, two days after it happened. But, yeah, I mean, it's going to be... It's going to be a grind. Like, this is all the more reason that the Cardinals need more out of their starting pitchers, get deeper into games so that they can help the bullpen not be overtaxed because they're overtaxed and it's mid-April. It's not like we're talking about this and it's August and you go, yeah, it's been a long season for those guys. Nah, man, it's April still. And now, you know, seven of the eight relievers, I think, are going to be available when it comes to leverage. And I would say this, they already haven't really used Chris Stratton in those leverage spots, right? He's more of the middle relief guy. And so... You're looking at Helsley, who has historically, you know, needed an extra day here and there. They try to keep him healthy. Gallegos, who has been the rubber band arm and has really not been hurt in a while, knock on wood. Uh, so they're going to hope that he's able to to be good to go. Uh, and when I say hurt, like IL stint, long-term injury. I know he had the little back thing that flared up at the beginning of the year. But uh, Gio looks good right now. 
Verhagen looks good right now. It's kind of like Gio Verhagen and and Helsley are your your three go tos from the right side. And Zach Thompson can can do anything and get anybody out because he's he's just been fantastic. Uh, four more outs on Sunday for Zach Thompson, but. Yeah, I mean, you're limited if you're Ollie Marmel, man. I, I think it is a little bit of a tricky spot for him to be in uh, with this Jordan Hicks thing. I don't know how it came to be that they decided that. Like I said, I'm not going to tell you it's one way when when I don't know that to be true for a fact. Um, but I do think it's interesting to talk about because it is going to put the Cardinals into a bind if he's not able to work his way back into his his typical sense uh, pretty quickly. Now, you might, as a Cardinals fan, say, ah, this is better because it's what they already should have done, whether they needed to have a meeting about it or not. You can't put this guy into leverage because he is just you know, he's getting shelled every time he goes out there or he's missing the strike zone to where he needs to come in, uh, have somebody rescue him. Whatever the case is, it's been a struggle for Hicks. Uh, the Cardinals could really use him getting better. But you're feeling better about the vibes before I had that Jordan Hicks uh, little, little recap with you because the Cardinals did win the game on Sunday. And then Monday they're going into that one looking to, A, avoid Zach Gallen in the Diamondbacks because Gallen pitched Sunday. So, yay, you don't have to face him. Um, but, you know, we'll see what the Cardinals are able to do against the starters the D-backs do put out there. Still feel like the offense is a click away, like uh, five runs in 10 innings today. One of them comes from a Manford man. They they came up with the clutch hits when they needed them very, very late in this game, like at the very bitter end. But ultimately, if they had done it sooner, maybe the, the situation is different. They don't need to win in an extra innings the way that they did. Uh, so the offense, I think the onus is still on them going into the Arizona series. But it's also on the starting pitching to get a little deeper and help this bullpen. Jack Flair, you'll have the first chance to do that on Monday. Uh, we'll talk about it. I'll be at the game, and we'll talk about things on uh, Be Shafe Daily for Tuesday morning. So make sure you're locked in here on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. And if you would like to support the show and all the work that I'm putting in here, patreon.com slash bshafer12 is the way you can do it. Thank you guys so much for joining me for this edition of v Shape Daily. I appreciate you guys as always. Let me know if you have questions, anything you would like to know or comment about the team. I'm always available at bshafer12 on Twitter, so hit me up there. Don't be shy, and uh, we'll talk to you next time on bshafe Daily. Peace.